Hello, men. Um, I'm honored to be here with you guys. I just wanted to uh, talk to you today about a man and fear of man. Uh, the topic that we're going to be talking about is a man and fear of man. And um, obviously, we're doing this here together um, as men because God's design um, has us as men, as, as leaders of the family, as leaders of our community, as leaders in our church, and uh, what we do, um, others follow. So I want to start off with, um, with a, a quick prayer, and then we'll get into it. Um, a man in the fear of man. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we're just humbled. We, um, we're grateful, God, that we are able to call you our Father, that you call us your sons. God, we, um, we love you. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to be together as men, meeting in this format digitally, um, whether we're meeting in person or whether we're meeting in this way, God. We know that you are with us and that you honor it, God, and we, we praise you for that. God, we pray that you would just um, be with me, be with the men that watch this, um, and I pray that you would bless it, that you would speak through me, God, that you would challenge the men, God, that we would be men who walk in fear of you, fear and reverence, God, of you rather than in fear of men. God, that we would avoid the insecurities that come with being in fear of men, God, as, as we are so often in fear of men, God, I pray that you would just deliver us from that, and God, that um, we would be the men that you've called us to be. We love you, God. We praise your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, men, um, we're going to start off in Proverbs 29, 25. Um, you can pause it if you like. To get there, I'll just go ahead and and read the scripture. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So we're talking about the fear of man. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So first off, um, you've got to ask yourself, what exactly is a snare? A snare is obviously a trap, right? A snare is a trap. A snare is a restraint. Um, and when you bring a when you bring a a snare, um, you're 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 delivering. Okay, I'm gonna pause, Becky, and I'm gonna start over about the snare point. Forgive me. Five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Go. So, what is a snare? A snare is a trap. A snare is a restraint. A snare is something um, that's going to apprehend us. It's going to take us captive. And um, the scripture tells us that a fear, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So it, it obviously means that if we're ensnared, we are not safe. Um, are you seeking, so the, the first point, the first blank there, are you seeking man's approval? Um, if the fear of man brings a snare, um, what is the fear of man? That's the obvious question, right? So the, the, the curriculum defines that as showing care or action, uh, concern, showing concern towards man and wanting to please man. Um, how many of us are guilty of that? How many of us are guilty of wanting to please man? I think... Um, I think every single one of us suffers with that issue, um, whether it's the the young the young man that who's in school, maybe still a popular guy, an athlete, um, a leader of you know, president, a class president, you know, academic leader, or what have you. Um, those who we might obviously look at and say, okay, he's got he's a leader, um, he's got followers, or maybe there's someone who's not so obvious. Um, a computer person, a, a, a loner, if you will, a person who's more of an introverted um, guy. Do uh, do you think that they suffer with the same issue of, of fear of man? Um, because I believe we all do. Um, older men, uh, whether we're talking about a business leader, a business executive, or whether we're talking about a janitor, um, leaders of organizations or, or not, 
Um, who suffers from the fear of man? I believe we all do. Um, our, our actions are, are, are dictated by those insecurities. And we'll get to insecurity soon, but um, this next blank here says, the fear of man takes God's people captive and has made many preachers, politicians, and parents in this country prisoner. Um, when we bring a snare, the original language um, tells us that we set in place a snare. Um, the fear of man does that. So it's, kind of, it's important for us to, to I guess, um, trust in the Lord in order to protect ourselves from that captivity that comes with um, fear of man. So let's move on. Um, we're going to, there, there's some pretty, pretty good quotes here. I won't read them for you. You can read them yourself. Um, but they are really good quotes and I, and I really don't want you to skip over them. Um, what are the snares that I can expect though? We're talking about snares. What are the snares that I can expect if I live my life in the fear of man? Um, again, we want to define snares. So we talked about it being a trap, something that restrains you, um, something that imprisons or holds you captive. So insecurities. Um, there's several different uh, snares here that we're going to cover. The first one, I think the main one is the snare of insecurity. Insecurity is the result of placing my confidence or my trust in people or things that can be taken away from me. Um, for example, my money, my job, and of course, um, you have your own examples, right? These are my examples, and these are just some general examples, but these are, these are some real examples here, right? My money can be taken away. My job can go away. My job title. Um, my, my boss, I have a good relationship. I've got somebody in leadership that's in my corner. What if she goes away? What if she goes to, what if she gets promoted to a different area? What if she moves to a new field or gets fired for God's sake, for, um, you know, any, anything could happen. God forbid. Um, my 401k, my security blanket, my savings, um, they could go away. What else? Who, so who else do we put our confidence in. So those are some of the things that we put that I put my confidence in. What about people? Um, I'm not a parent yet, but what about some of you parents out there? Do you put your, your confidence in your children? Um, what about you married men? Do you put your confidence in your spouse? Um, your parents, do you put your confidence in, again, your children or your friends, um, children, parents, spouses, friends? Who do we put our confidence in? Um, are we placing our confidence in the right place, in the right people? Because there's only one person that we need to be placing our confidence in, and his name is Jesus Christ. Um, there's only one place that we can put our confidence in, and it won't ensnare us. The, the next point here in, in our pamphlet here, in our, in our booklet, if you're motivated by the praise of men, you will be defeated by their criticism. Security is placing my confidence or trust in that which cannot be taken away from me. So let's go back again. Um, you'll be defeated by their criticism. I think that's a pretty powerful point because um, they're unreliable. You, the, your, your children, your, your parents, your spouses, your friends are unreliable. And, you, and the criticism will come. The, the praise may come, but the criticism will follow. And how can... How can that sustain you? How can that be your motivating factor? It shouldn't be. Um, how can you have your security in that? Well, you can't. Because if you look at the next point again, that we reread it, security is placing my confidence or trust in that which cannot be taken away. All those other, th other things can be taken away and easily. Um, so what are the two things that, that cannot be taken away from us? That's easy. Um, that's our relationship. That's our faith. That's our Hope in Jesus Christ. That's um, the foundation. That's the salvation and the core of our beliefs. Everything that we stand on is, is Jesus Christ, the solid rock that cannot be taken away from us, where our confidence should always lie. And what's the, what's the second? So if there's a second piece, it's the written word. It's what we refer to. It's what he's left here um, with us. It's his, it's his living word. And so those, those, are, those are the things where we should be placing our confidence, our relationship with Jesus Christ and his, his word, his, his living word. Um, I do like this next point here. It says insecurity can be quite natural in a leader. That doesn't make it something you can, can afford to put up with. 
Um, we talked about who suffers from the fear of man. Um, I think one of the enemy's oldest tricks is to make you feel alone. And, and I, it's not a, I think. It's, it's, it's the truth. One of the enemy's oldest tricks is to make you feel alone in your suffering. To make you feel like you're the only one, you're the only Christian with this issue. You're the only believer who could stoop to this type of a low, this type of filth or wickedness, the embarrassment of it all. How could you ever admit to such sinful ways when you're the only one doing it? But that's the... That's that's the trick of the enemy because you're never the only one. Let me put it plainly. I know that I've been fooled into thinking I was the only one many times, but let's let's put that that lie uh, to bed. We're never the only one. There's always someone, um, many someones, with the same sufferings, with the same temptations as us. And and you know something that always and this is just kind of a side note, but. I've, James 5.16 talks about confessing our faults to one to another that you may be healed so that we can pray for each other. The fervent, effectual prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And so it's, it's just a, we're never alone in our suffering. And so it's, um, it's, it's a matter of humbling ourselves, of confessing, and, um, and then that's, a, that's the point where, where we're able to get past it. Um, so the point number two, the snare of ignorance. Um, the snare of ignorance. That's uh, blank number two there. That's our second snare. Um, if doubt replaces awe, you will soon give up on all the gospel. That one hit a core with me. It struck a core. If doubt replaces awe, that's A-W-E, awe, like awe-inspiring. Um, the gospel should always inspire awe in us. The gospel should always inspire awe in us. The doubt that we sometimes struggle with, um, can be our worst enemy. I've seen this in loved ones. I've, I've been that loved one um, in the past, and maybe some of you guys have been as well, my Lord will, and maybe you have not, but, but when doubt replaces awe, you'll soon give up on all the gospel disciplines of the, of the Christian life. Um, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it play out time and time again um, in my young life, and um, some of you men that are younger than me, older than me, um, have, pro have possibly seen it as well. And so it's important that we um, stay informed of the knowledge of God. And that's what we're going to come to next. Um, ignorance causes lawlessness, which refers to the state of living apart from the law or will of God. It's as though God had no law or had never given his law to men. It's one of the most grievous of consequences of an ignorance to God. So when we're talking about living apart from God, um, it, it comes from from doubt. It's, it originates in a place of doubt, um, and before you know it, you're you're not living the gospel disciplines, the gospel disciplines of the Christian life. I think that that um, is just speaking to um, something that I learned from my father years ago. I remember when I went through a very dark season of life, and my father and I hit rock bottom. I ended up losing my job. I broke both of my hands in a fight. I had to go live with my dad and um, couldn't work. And when I, when I began to heal, um, and even before that, my dad, a man of God that I respect and that really taught me a lot um, in that season, you know, he, <laughs> he showed me what a intentional quiet time looked like. And he would wake me up early at 5 a.m. in the morning and he wouldn't let me go back to sleep if I wasn't. He'd come back in the room and make sure I was having my quiet time, make sure I was kneeling next to my bed and make sure I was in the word of God. Um, doing a proverb a day um, and really getting the intentional aspect of the relationship down pat. Um, it, w one thing that he impressed upon me, he said, Charles, if you want to have a relationship with me, you're going to speak to me. You're going to intentionally be in contact and in relationship with me. Um, you're going to speak to me and you're going to hear back from me. That's what you need to be doing with your Heavenly Father. Um, and that's what that's what we're talking about here, getting that knowledge, but getting that interaction and having that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that's, and this is a side note, but I, I can't help but get sidetracked a little bit when, when I talk about the intentional um, time that we need to be having in the mornings and just daily, if, if not in the mornings, um, with our Heavenly Father to foster that relationship, um, to get to know Him on a, 
on a, on a personal basis, if you will, to get to know the nature of our Father God and to get to know um, His will, to hear from Him, um, so that we don't feel like our, pr our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and so that we, so that we can hear from our Father. Uh, I, I'll never forget what that season looked like for me, you know, reading the Word of God after I had been in prayer um, and, and really hearing back and realizing that, oh my gosh, this is the living Word. I can talk to him and then I can hear back from his word, which is incredible to me. Um, so the more we, re we reject the knowledge of God, the more unrestrained and immoral we become. Um, and we, we see that easily. We can see that reflected in our culture. Um, the more we reject the knowledge of God, the more unrestrained and immoral we become. So what have we, how have we seen that? Um, I don't, the, the easiest example that I, that I can think of, I just finished a film class. So the ratings, the movie ratings, um, what we see on our TV, you know, you can hear curse words that you couldn't hear when I was a kid on, on cable television. Um, you name it, the music. Every, every, in every way, our culture reflects a more unrestrained, a more immoral um, culture, a more immoral behavior. And so that's, that's part of the snare of ignorance is that we've rejected the knowledge of God um, as a culture. And so let's not individually fall into those same traps, into those same snares. Um, there's something, there's a couple different verses here um, reference Judges 17, 6, Judges 21, 25. I would encourage you to read those. Um, but there's a passage, a couple passages in Hosea 4, and I'm, I'm kind of going to chop it up. Hosea 4, the second half of verse 1 there reads, There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. So just for context, um, this is God's judgment of the nation of Israel, as we've seen throughout the Old Testament. Um, if we move down to verse 6, Hosea 4, verse 6, excuse me, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you, because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. Excuse me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. So, God is passing judgment on his children, on his people, and even on their children. Um, why? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you. You have rejected knowledge, so I reject you. That's a powerful warning, um, if you will. Um, if it could happen to God's people, it, could, it can happen to us. Um, how easily can we fall into the snare of ignorance? Um, so we have to be intentional about our pursuit of knowledge rather than our objection of knowledge. There's two scriptures that came to mind as I was in prayer and I was meditating on, on, on this, uh, these teachings on my way here to, 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 do, to record this message. Um, they are here. I have them highlighted here in my Bible. Proverbs, Chapter 9, verse 10, talks about the fear of the Lord. Our, our topic here is the fear of man, but on the flip side, we should have a fear, a reverent fear, right, of the Lord. Isn't that, that my prayer is for us as men to be fearful and irreverent, not in a fearful like my knees are quaking and, oh, oh God, is going to strike me down necessarily. Not that type of a fear of the Lord, a fear, a reverent fear, a respectful fear, a fear that would honor the Lord, a fear that is obedient to the Lord, um, that type of a fear. Um, we talk about a fear of man and a fear of what they're going to think or what are they going to say or what, how, how, how um, should I act in order to, we always think of the, the, whole, the whole cliche notion of keeping up with the Joneses, right? Um, well, let's, uh, let's put that, let's do away with that. Um, let's talk about being in fear, in reverent fear of our of our Father God. And so Proverbs nine ten says, "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding." So isn't isn't that the type of fear that we that we should be striving to have, that we should have? My my prayer again is that us as men and 
and not just us men, our, us, uh, our wives, my, my wife-to-be, our spouses, our, our, you know, our children, my, ch- my children-to-be, um, all of us, our, our community, our church, would strive for wisdom, would pray for wisdom, would seek after wisdom, because the scripture tells us that if we seek it, that we'll get it, that God will give us wisdom. But where does it begin? It begins with the fear of the Lord. Um, on the flip side, we're talking about knowledge here, right? Wisdom, knowledge, if you want to kind of differentiate between the two. Well, Proverbs 1, verse 7, chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So you see here in Proverbs, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in chapter 9, but also there in chapter 1, it says that it, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge as well. It's the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, the fear of the Lord. And so it sounds like it's where we are supposed to start um, in reverent fear of our Lord and Savior. So with knowledge obviously being kind of um, knowing what to do and knowing the scripture, knowing the law and wisdom, kind of discernment and how to apply it. Um, And we should be seeking both. Um, Those who have no knowledge of God or his will unrestrained in sin and act as self-appointed leaders apart from God um, will run unrestrained in sin and act as self-appointed leaders apart from God. So that's a, a, a stark warning um, for those of us who would dare to not seek after knowledge and wisdom as we've been um, warned against doing, doing that. Um, so next, our, our next snare, I think, I think this is our last snare, is the snare of idolatry. Snare number three, the last snare, is the snare of idolatry. Idolatry is putting what others think of me ahead of what God thinks of me. Any, I think we all could have filled in that blank um, without me giving it to you. Idolatry is putting what others think of me ahead of what God thinks of me. So this is, this one, um, kind of sums it up. I'm going to, well, we'll when, when we get to Galatians 1.10 here, I really think that sums it up. Um, but let's, let's keep reading these bullet points here. Idolatry occurs whenever we worship anything or anyone other than the living God. And now our worship doesn't necessarily mean falling on my knees and worshiping Baal. Or, you know, that's not, it doesn't mean that we are worshiping in that way. Um, our worship is the way that we live our lives. Our worship is how we prioritize. Our worship is what, you know, um, when we make sins of omission rather than sins of commission um, because we are doing, spending our time on something that we would rather spend our time on. Um, sometimes those are the idols in our lives that we have unwittingly placed above um, our relationship with God and, and the will of God and the mission that we're supposed to be on. So th- these are the ways that we fall into idolatry, or that's one way that I see it um, without, without realizing it when I'm doing it. Um, if you stop depending on God, you won't know when he's gone. And did you hear what I just said? I don't realize it when I'm doing it. You don't realize it. You don't know, but he's gone, and you are spending your time doing what you felt like you wanted to do. I'm spending my time doing what I wanted to do rather than um, being on mission, rather than using my life as, a, as living worship, as, as the word tells us to do. Um, we are our own barrier to experiencing fullness and freedom in Christ. As I talked about earlier, the feeling of my prayers bouncing off the ceilings. Um, It's, 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 it's a situation, I guess, when, when, we are not, when we are living in sin or when we are not living the way we're, we, need, we know we need to be, um, and we have put something in between. We have severed our relationship temporarily with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It, it can be restored. It can always be restored. But when, that's how we p- place a barrier between the fullness and freedom in Christ is by severing our relationships, severing our communication, cutting ourselves off from what we, from the promises and the fullness and 
and all that we could potentially have in, in Christ if we were just faithful. Um, so here's what we um, have to ask ourselves. Are we seeking God's approval? That first question was, are we seeking man's approval? Bullet point number one. Are we seeking man's approval or are we seeking God's approval? Right? Do we suffer from the fear of man syndrome or are we are we at the place of wisdom? Are we at the beginning of wisdom? Are we at the beginning of knowledge? Do we have the fear of God instead, which is where we should be? Whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe is what the scripture tells us. And so again, Galatians 1.10, which I think sums this whole premise up of what we're talking about here. It says, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. I think that sums it all up. Um, if we seek to please men, then we are in no way the servant, the bond servant, the slave, if you will, of Christ that we're called to be. Um, as men, I think that the, the onus is on us. It's important as leaders. That's God's design, as we prayed about in the beginning. That's God's design for our community, for our church, for our families. For us to lead um, when we do when we lead our families follow follow they fall in line if you will it's, it's a generality it's not a it's not a hard and fast rule but it's a general principle that is that it's true for many of us is that when we lead in a faithful way in a god-fearing way in a way that is obe in an obedient way um, god's design is such that others follow us and oftentimes it's whether it's the obvious family members that we might realize are following us or whether it's somebody who works next to us or near us or observes us that we don't even see so i think the onus is on us as men and this is so important um for us and i, I just i'm really glad that us that we as a church have have really taken these strides to to challenge our men and to challenge because it goes deeper than just us men the challenge is not for just us. The challenge is for all of us, for all of our families, and um, again for our communities. So, um, Psalm nine ten here says, "Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you." Um, and the point that the original, uh, I guess the the original video, of the curriculum. It's not my my quote. The, it says, it's hard to trust in someone that you do not know. And I think um, that goes obviously for earthly and spiritual relationships, right? If we want someone to trust in us, then we have to um, get to know them. We have to, we have to let them know us. And if we want to be able to, if we want to have trust in God, we have to get to know him. We have to have knowledge of him. We have to know who he is. Um, and so the, the, those three points here, the last three blanks in the, in the book, live as a man unleashed, live as a man unhindered, and live as a man unashamed. And we can kind of go through those a little bit more. Um, the unhindered, live as a man unhindered, means to live as a man with the anointing of God. Live as a man with God's touch on our lives. Um... Acts 4.13 says now, and we're going to, 13 through 21, so bear with me for a few minute, for a minute here. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign had been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name, the name of Jesus. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must not judge. For we cannot 
but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. So that is a good example of men walking unhindered. When they tried to find a way to, to hinder Peter and, to, and John, the people were praising God. There was no way for them to, to hinder them. God's anointing was on them. They were blessed. They were going to move freely, and they were going to spread the word of God, regardless of what they were commanded to, to say or to not to say. So Acts 4, 13 to 21, I thought that was a pretty powerful one of being um, unhindered. I skipped over unleashed and went right to unhindered. So I'm going to go back to unleashed. Forgive me for that. Um, so live as a man unleashed. That just means to live as a man with God's authority on your life. Um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Freedom. This is what we're talking about. Giving us the power to be men of God giving us the power to be unleashed. And with God's authority, that, that we're called to be bold. Um, I th we talked about what comes natural to men earlier, um, that quote, and I, oh gosh, I don't know if I can find it. Insecurity can be quite natural in a leader. That doesn't make it something that you can afford to put up with. The quote by Johnny Hunt. Well, I, it, yeah, we, we might be naturally timid, um, but we're called to be bold. We're called to be men of God. And a man of God... Um, has a new nature, amen. And I, I think um, I think we're called to be to be different from what our natural selves used to be. Um, so be men that live unleashed. And the last, un, unashamed. Live as a man unashamed. Let's get back down to that one. That just means to be authentic. Um, and that uh, tie you can tie that together to the boldness. Um, I think. Um, and the, the scripture here that we have to reference is in John 12. John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43 read, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And I think that um, that's a good note to end on. We're talking about... Um, the glory that comes from man, the fear and the insecurity and the motivation to follow after man and to please man. But this scripture warns against that um, and talks about the glory that comes from man rather than the glory that comes from God. I think that we, and, and, I, and we all know it's true, we need to be men that seek to glorify our, our Lord and Savior, to seek to glorify God and be men that are unashamed, living authentic as believers um, who, who, are, who are doing what we're called to do. So um, I think we're going to close on that. I'm going to just say a quick prayer for us, and, um, and we're done. So thanks, men, for joining me. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to look into your word, God, to learn a little bit about the nature of you, to learn about the the way that you've called us to be men of God, the way that you've called us, God, to be men that are unashamed, God, that men that not fear other men, not men that are driven by insecurities, God, not men that are motivated out of the, uh, motivated to please men. God, let us be men that are motivated to please you, motivated to glorify you, motivated, God, to be transformed into your likeness, motivated, God, to have a will that is transformed into your will. God, make our our thoughts your thoughts. God, make our desires your desires. God, I pray that you would just use us, men. I pray that you would bless this time that we have together, God. I pray that your words would not come back void. I pray that you would use this time, God, that you would be glorified. And God, I pray that us as men, that we would be bold and that we would lead our families, that we would lead our communities, that you would speak through us, God, and that you would do your work, that your kingdom would be advanced, and God, that we can just glorify you and that you would get the honor from it. We, we love you, we thank you, we praise your holy name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.